Good day and welcome to today's webinar, The Inevitable Revolution from Healthcare to an Ecosystem of Health. My name is Chris Keller and I'll be one of your hosts today. The webinar is beginning and we're grateful to have our, our guests here to speak today. With me joining is David Holmberg, President and CEO of Highmark Health and Annie Lamont, Co-Founder and Managing Partner of Oak HCFT. And joining me also to host is Seth Cohen, co-founder and co-CEO of UDA Health. Today, you're in for a real treat as Seth, David, and Annie have a conversation about healthcare innovation, disruption, and an inevitable revolution. Today's webinar is being recorded, and within 48 hours, we'll send out a link to an on-demand recording, transcripts, and the slides. We'll also be taking questions throughout today's discussion. You can submit your questions using the questions panel at the bottom of your Zoom controls. You can also vote up questions that you like, and you can comment on other people's questions. So please use those tools to engage. So to begin, let me make introductions. Seth Cohen is co-founder and co-CEO of UDA Health. Previous to UDA Health, Seth served as the Vice President of Sales and Alliances for Castlight Health. At Castlight, Led, Seth led the team responsible for market partnerships and key national accounts. Seth was one of the earliest employees at Castlight and served on the leadership team. Seth is currently a member of Castlight's board of directors. Prior to Castlight, Seth was a management consultant at McKinsey and Company. At McKinsey, Seth was a member of the healthcare payer and provider practice and a founding member of McKinsey's Center for Healthcare Reform. Seth earned an MBA from Harvard Business School as a Baker Scholar and an MPA from Harvard Kennedy School. Seth completed his undergraduate studies at Stanford University as a Phi Beta Kappa. Seth loves outdoor sports and performing impromptu musicals with his two young children. Joining Three now. now. <laughs> Say it again, Seth. Three now. Sorry, that was uh, needed to be updated in case Got my it. children ever listen to this. <laughs> Thank you. Joining us as well as David Holmberg. David leads Highmark Health, an $18 billion blended health organization that includes one of America's largest Blue Cross Blue Shield insurers and a growing regional hospital and physician network. David joined Highmark in 2007 and served in a series of executive positions, including president of its diversified businesses where he was responsible for businesses representing more than $3.5 billion in revenue. Chief executive officer for HVHC Inc and chief executive officer and chairman for HM Insurance Group, United Concordia Dental and San Antonio, Texas based VisionWorks which was divested in 2016 for $1.6 billion. Holmberg is, David is the chairman of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and member of the board of directors with America's health insurance plans. He received his master's of business administration from the University of Texas at Dallas and is a graduate of the Harvard Business School's advanced management program. Annie Lamont is co-founder and managing partner at Oak HCFT. Annie focuses on growth equity and early stage venture opportunities in healthcare and fintech. Annie currently serves on the boards of Advise Health Holdings, Brightline, CareBridge, Independent Living Systems, Oncology Analytics, UDA Health, Precision Medicine Group, Quartet, Rubicon Founders, TruePill, Vesta Health, Village MD, and is a board observer at Notable. Annie is also actively involved with Blend, Devoted Health, Inscripta, and Komodo Health. Annie was the first recipient of the National Venture Capital Association's Award for Excellence in Healthcare Innovation. And he was honored with Healthcare Private Equity Association's 2017 Russell L. Carson Award for Lifetime Achievement in Healthcare Investing. And he serves as a core participant of the Health and Human Services Deputies, Deputy Secretary's Innovation and Investment Summit. And he received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Stanford University. We have great people joining us today. So with that, let me turn the time over to Seth. Seth, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was going to offer if uh, David and Annie wanted to add anything to the introductions, but I think we've covered that. Um, and I'm just grateful that you introduced me first. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. And one thing that wasn't covered in the introductions is just how grateful I am personally that I get to lead this with two mentors of mine, um, you know, Annie for a very long time across two different companies, David recently. And so I'm just so, so grateful to be able to be here with you both. Um, so we're going to dive in, in a second, but I do want to go to the next slide briefly, Chris, and just acknowledge today is uh, quite a day. I didn't, we didn't necessarily plan for this webinar to take place um, at a milestone announcement for our company, but I'm delighted of the coincidence. And I just want to briefly note that that 
As of this morning, we officially announced that Cedar and Uta Health are coming together as one company. Cedar is an amazing company in the patient financial space. They have created a leading platform to serve providers um, in their engagement with the patient financial needs. UDA, of course, has been in this space for a long time, but more oriented to the payer side of the world. And coming together, we will be the first complete patient financial solution. So I just wanted to offer this brief uh, announcement. Um, please check out social media or follow up with us on our website to learn more. Um, there's a press release posted there, but really thrilled. Um, this, is a, this is a momentous day um, for our company. Okay. Well, with that, um, let's dive in. So David, let's start with you. Um, you've talked before about this notion of the inevitable revolution and that consumers are demanding it. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming. So is it here? Has it arrived? And, and what is it? Well, Seth, from my perspective, it has been a long time coming. You know, we, we've all talked about evolution and revolution within uh, healthcare. And, you know, when 18% of the GDP for our country is spent on some form of healthcare, uh, you really start to have to question uh, how affordable is it for individual families, particularly when you think about it on a percentage of household income. And so uh, I think we're here. I, I think, you know, the pandemic uh, showed the extraordinary capabilities we have as a country and fighting, um, you know, a, um, a, a common enemy. And at the same time, it showed the need for uh, dramatic innovation. Uh, and when I think about it, you know, I mean, I look at uh, telemedicine, uh, virtual medicine, and, you know, the dramatic uptake that we saw, and how it really uh, created a new bridge uh, to creating access to care, and also has the potential to make healthcare affordable. Mm -hmm. And do you think because of the pandemic, we will see this revolution arrive now? Is that, is it, that has been the key catalyst, or do you think it's other factors coming together to make now the time? Well, Seth, the way I think about it is, you know, is consumers have, have clearly, um, you know, let us know that uh, they have unmet needs. And, you know, there's a unique opportunity for uh, those of us in healthcare, whether you're a startup or a larger institution like ours, you know, that's transforming uh, to be able to fill those needs and to be much more customer and patient centric. Mm -hmm. And so what the pandemic did was amplify uh, the cracks that were already there. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about um, how our system works today with specialty care and how we do referrals and the, you know, the, the need for pre-authorizations and things like that, uh, those are all friction points. And what consumers have told us is, you know, if you simplify you know, uh, the experience, make it a, greater, or a better experience, if you eliminate the friction points, and if you tell me how much I'm going to owe and assure me that I'm going to be taken care of, uh, they're in and they're willing to adapt and adjust. And so we think there's a unique opportunity that the pandemic has driven, you know, to uh, accelerate it. And, and that's why organizations like yours and what Annie does and, and what we believe we're doing with our living health model, uh, we think can be quite effective. That's great. We're going to come back to living health shortly, but Annie, let me turn it to you. I mean, to, to say that your fund has been active over the past year is a little bit of an understatement. So is, the, is this a revolution in healthcare? What is your point of view on the consumer in all of this? You've been doing this for a long time. Absolutely. It's definitely a tipping point. And I think the, the wonderful thing about innovation in healthcare was that there were a number of tech entrepreneurs and new you know, young talent, including yourself years ago, that have come into healthcare and, and I think have begun to revolutionize what we're doing and transform it. But there is no doubt. I mean, we were more active than we've ever been in the last year. And it's because companies are actually growing faster. And in part, because of this virtualization, we've been focused on virtualization and home care uh, for a long time. But the reality is that you had massive behavior change, which is the hardest thing to do. And it's not just on the consumer's part, but very much on doctor's part too. Like, And they, they were, yes, everyone was forced to be virtual, but mm -hmm. also had reimbursement. And no one is going to, you know, no one wants to ask a doctor to uh, you know, not get paid for a visit, right? And the reality was when they weren't getting paid for a, a visit, whether it was tele or video visit, you know, they weren't going to do it. Um, and so you have just had a transformation on reimbursement uh, that we hope sticks uh, and hopefully licensure, you know, follows it. Uh, along with just behavior change by, by individuals. Um, so I think that is 
we would say it has literally accelerated uh, innovation by five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, well, you know, I know we'll get into this, but we'll talk about like what that means because it's not just that one visit with the doctor. It's really the whole B2C online revolution that's happened and, um, and is being enabled by a number of companies that create the ability to have a doctor visit along with diagnostic, home diagnostics, along with home prescribing um, that, that make for a totally different experience. That's interesting. Will you say a little bit more on the B2C point I thought was really interesting because I remember when I first got in this space 10, 15 years ago, B2C was not a place you wanted to go in healthcare. It was always an enterprise approach and the B2C companies, and I won't name them, we can think of some of them, didn't yeah. work out. So do you feel like now is the time for that B2C approach? Yeah, well, I th it's so interesting because you literally asked me two years ago, like, no, we don't do B2C in healthcare because consumers don't pay, right? And so you, you've obviously seen some examples of consumers paying, but the, the, the rethink on this mm. is that online is simply may start B2C, but it's mm. really just another p provider in the network. Is just another provider in the network. So when I think of when you think about healthcare, going to your local doctor is B to C, right? How did you find that doctor? Well, you might have found him on Zocdoc. You might have found him usually through a friend. You know, references them. You are it's a B to C experience. It ha just happened to be in person, mm. but, you know. And then that doctor or provider has a relationship with a payer where they're getting reimbursed for what they're doing. So it's really just, it's like omni-channel and e-commerce. And, you know, we do e-commerce FinTech and it was like, wow, to see them both explode at the same time last year was absolutely fascinating because the, the virtualization of the home experience to like doing your, you know, like buying a house and getting a mortgage and a title and everything from your bedroom was the same thing that was effectively going on in the healthcare world. And like all of a sudden the virtual experience were, you know, were being enabled. So, you know, we've now been investing in some of these companies like Cerebral, that is a, yes, it's a B2C online company that's doing, you know, talk therapy, but a subscription model of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. drugs that have come in, you know, that they're, that, coaches and but doctors behind them are prescribing, uh, you know, actually with a, a, you know, and I hate the idea of like pill mill. It's, it's absolutely not because just looking at like when you go to your local doctor, they actually won't give you another prescription unless you've seen it, you know, have talked to mm -hmm. a doctor online uh, and, you know, are, are actually pair along just mm -hmm. prescriptions, so, it, you know, and that company's exploded and, you know, and now getting reimbursed by payers because, Reality is it's just another way to access the healthcare system. And I talked to, in fact, one of the CEOs and one of the major blues said the son was in another state in New York at NPO and didn't have a local doctor and needed his uh, anti anxiety meds. And, you know, so they had to go to the doctor in one of the other Northeast states and prescribe for basically get a prescription, FedEx that prescription, right? Get it local, FedEx it to, you know, him in New York City. I'm like, that's just a horrible experience for everyone, uh, certainly for the, you know, the patient. So it's really just an enablement. It's another, it's a, just a better, you know, provide, it's just an additional provider network. Um, so omni-channel virtual consumer first strategies. I mean, David, this is seem like, seems like the time to talk about living health, right? Um, so what is living health? Maybe let's start there. Why now? Um, and what does it mean for Highmark? So living health for us is, is um, you know, working with consumers and truly understanding their unmet needs and moving, you know, I, I totally agree with Annie, you know, um, historically payers have been on one side of the, of the table, providers have been on the other side of the table. And, you know, there was some sort of negotiation. Living health is about bringing everybody to the same side of the table uh, in service of our customers, our, our members, our, our patients. And so, uh, so and, and that's what we're doing, you know, with the Allegheny Health Network uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we just announced with Christiana in Delaware, you know, this is all about, you know, how do we work together and, you know, and again, figure out those unmet needs, you know, reduce the friction points, and make sure that the economics reinforce the right behavior, which is about getting upstream, you know, uh, and dealing with the issues, uh, bringing in, you know, mental health and behavioral health uh, into the equation, 
and finding ways to, to avoid those acute incidences that, that tend to happen. And so uh, our, our interest is in bringing together um, the, the rich technology that exists today that wasn't here 20 years ago, uh, adding our clinical expertise and, you know, and bringing to bear, you know, um, you know, all the financial components that are necessary to really change things. That's why we're doing the Google partnership and with Verily uh, to develop different clinical pathways. You know, that's why we're embedding them in products and solutions on the insurance side so that, um, so that uh, employers understand the value. And you start to bring all this together in a way that's different than what has been done in the past. So what, what will that look like if I'm a member of Highmark and I'm in this living health model? You talk about moving upstream. So how, how will this model help anticipate and engage me in things versus today's kind of model? Well, uh, you know, essentially you're in the center of the model, uh, you and the clinician, and you have a curated experience that comes uh, around you. And that curated experience, you know, will be different for each individual. Uh, think of it as mass customization. You know, because, you know, and we used to own an eyewear company and that's exact, exactly what we did. No one uh, pair of glasses was exactly like the next pair. Uh, but at the same time, you had a suite of products and solutions that you offered. You as an individual, um, mm -hmm. if, you know, at the age you're at today, and I'm pretty sure Annie said that you're an old guy now, by the way. And, and yes. I could be right. wrong. You know, but, you know, with three kids, you know, your healthcare needs are different than uh, somebody who's 65 and about to retire from a factory and who's, you know, got, um, you know, chronic disease. So it's all about, you know, creating a suite of solutions that surround you and that, you know, you're able to draw on depending on what your needs are at that point in your life. It's all about consumer insights, you know, and as you know, I, I come from an unconventional background started my career as a retailer. And in retail, you got to win your, you know, your business every single day mm -hmm. by having the right products and solutions. But the consumer chooses. The healthcare system today is one of the few things that, you know, in this country that consumers purchase where they have to conform to it. And so uh, when Annie talks about all the different uh, organizations that she's involved with, what they're doing is disrupting the existing, you know, sort of status quo and they're filling unmet needs. And then what we're trying to do with Living Health is to bring the right set of solutions uh, to surround you so that they meet, they meet your need um, at that particular point in your life. Mm. That's great. By the way, I wanna mention, uh, in case it wasn't clear from this webinar, we are not using PowerPoints or Google Slides for keeping this conversational and we do welcome you into the conversation. So please post questions that you might have in the chat and Chris, our moderator, will help make sure that those are surfaced. So please don't be shy as we go. Um, but with that said, I want to turn that to you then, Annie, is, is that, do you, do you agree with that? Is, is mass customization um, the model that you're seeing successful? I mean, what, or maybe give us an example or two of what you've seen as like just dynamite consumer models um, here in this space. Great. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, I guess I'd love to step back because I think, you know, one advantage David has is an integrated system. He carries payer, he understands provider. You know, I think it's incredibly important to be thinking about how you pay and how systems are set up because it's all about incentives. Mm -hmm. So it's really like payment models. I mean, we're thinking that where the, the consumer patient is, you know, uh, is primary in it, you know, but the reality is if I'm an employer and generally I am, you know, I am being delivered, you know, one or two options um, and I'm not the one actually choosing what those insurance options are. Um, so the you know the what we're focused on is and when we when we think about healthcare in general right now is we think about it from kind of primary care out uh, and someone who's a caregiver who is it, you know let's start with the primary care physician being incented to think about that patient over the long term and their health uh, and the only way you do that is by the right incentives of having. Um, basically that capitated individual uh, being, you know, covered, um, you know, their full global cap responsibility for the cost of that individual, because eventually they should be driving 70% of the costs uh, in healthcare for, you know, for a, a member. Um, and I, you know, and I, I think the reality is, and I, you know, I've been saying that we're, we're consumers when we're all right. And we're patients when we're sick. And the reality is what happens is 
we listen to our doc, right? We should. We should listen to our doctors. We obviously educate ourselves too. But we need somebody who actually thinking about managing all the ways we interface with the system. And for a consumer to just be out there, I mean, I could be saying, hey, I want now, like I want to get this, you know, orthopedic surgeon and I want to go to this person. I want to go to this doctor. None of those doctors are talking to each other. Nobody knows what I'm doing. I'm trying to manage my health, right? But you, I have no data on those. Do- I don't know that that doctor is, you know, like much more likely to give me back surgery. I don't know that that OBGYN is a 30% cesarean rate when, you know, really the average should be 11. Um, so the health system, like, we have to be wrapped around by somebody who cares, a provider who is actually incented to provide excellent quality care and cares about the long-term costs, you know, for us as individuals, but for the system. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is what we're interested in when we're investing in things. We want to be in things that, that are lowering costs, improving outcomes, quality, and patient experience, and like putting that all together. Um, so you know, that's how we think about the interfacing. Like you have got to have a great, ultimately all these entities need to come together to create a singular unified patient experience. Um, and that is, that is going to be when the consumer patient wins. Um, I, what I, one thing I loved Seth was that the JD after, uh, the Affordable Care Act came out, Obamacare was implemented, and there were all these like people screaming about narrow networks and limiting choice, and oh God, Americans do not like to have choice limited. You know, but then you did the J.D. Powers survey five years later of like, what were consumers happiest in? Where did they think they were getting the best care? Narrow networks, <laughs> you know, like they were care coordination and narrow networks. That is actually where they and have- People love their Kaiser plans. People love when, when you're in Kaiser, they love it, right? So there's clearly, it's not about having unlimited choice. No, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to get to a couple of the questions in the chat in a second, but I want to touch on something that you both mentioned. You know, payment model kind of requires a certain structure, partnerships. David, you mentioned Allegheny, you mentioned Christiana, you mentioned Google, right? So I, I do think that one of the reasons I was so excited for this conversation is that you have taken a very unique strategy, especially in the blues ecosystem. Um, with the way that you've thought about partnerships and structure. And so maybe we just spend a moment on that because to Annie's point, let's take a step back because living health exists within that structure, right? And so can you give us a little bit of the history there um, and talk to a little bit about why you've chosen to pursue that strategy? Well, I, Seth, I was very fortunate that, um, you know, we, we live in a hyper-competitive market and we were in a unique position as a, as a as the fourth largest Blue Cross Blue Shield plan at Highmark. You know, to um, you know, to choose to invest and in stabilize a um, at scale health system, the Allegheny mm-hmm. Health Network, which was twelve hospitals, you know, a couple thousand physicians. Uh, it does about three and a half billion dollars a year in revenue today. And you know, and what we found um, was in our efforts to preserve uh, competition and choice in the community, you know, that we had this very unique, um, you know, a live laboratory. Mm-hmm. Where we could, you know, we could see, you know, the decisions that we made on the payer side, how they played out uh, in a health system uh, and on the front lines, and we could draw uh, with a, a physician-led organization, uh, and you know, the, the various physicians in and get the concepts and ideas and understand, you know, where the opportunities were, and so uh, we've turned it into, you know, uh, what I would consider a transformational startup. Uh, at scale. I mean, uh, I, I have, um, you know, I, I love Annie and the work that she's done and, and the organization she's involved with. Some days I say to myself, gee, I'd like to go down to the warehouse district here in the strip and open up um, a startup down there and, and disrupt healthcare from that perspective. I look at it as though um, Highmark Health, we have a unique uh, position because we do have market density when it comes to insured mm-hmm. lives. We have the ability to, um, to bring organizations like yours in at, with the Allegheny Health Network, learn from it and quickly scale it over millions of people. Um, and so, you know, while we start from a little different position, you know, mm-hmm. we both are looking to accomplish the same thing, which is, uh, is bring value for the consumer, you know, find ways to improve access to care, quality and care and outcomes. And, you know, we're using the, the integrated model uh, to do that. And mm-hmm. so uh, in our world, you know, I mean, uh, it's a blended model. I mean, uh, we have the physicians at the table, you know, with the insurance people, 
uh, and the actuaries and, you know, and we're working together around clinical pathways and what product design should be used in order to uh, move care to at home. You know, rather than trying to protect an existing position, yeah. we want to partner with others and innovate and find ways to, you know, to deliver care differently. Yeah. I, uh, I think that when you mentioned that, I love the point you mentioned that you and Annie are kind of like in, in different, coming from different places, but with similar goals of, of looking for those partnerships. And, and I can be the first to acknowledge that our partnership with you and your team has been extraordinary. And we couldn't be more excited to work with you and Allegheny on the personalized billing experience, that mass customization, no patient bill should look the same, just like no eyeglass should look the same. And so we're proud of that. You have built a structure that has enabled partnerships with small tech companies like ours and big tech companies like Google. And I think a lot of folks who might be listening to this will say, well, I know how I know how it works for me to work with Annie and her team. Like they're a venture capital fund and I get the venture model. But a lot of people would say, but gosh, a really large integrated health you know, payer provider, like that must be a really tough partner to have with a young startup. I think it's worked well, but speak more to that. How do you think about partnering with companies like ours? And how do you ensure that those relationships are successful? Well, the way I think about it is, you know, I look for partners that make us better and that we make them better. So, uh, and yes, I mean, we have a great partnership with your organization and, and we're very excited about the potential to reduce the friction for the consumer, simplify billing and, you know, and, and eliminate maybe some of the, the barriers to people uh, engaging in the healthcare system. And so um, what we look for is people that have similar values you know, that um, are looking to, you know, that, that aren't satisfied with the status quo. Uh, and so when you're talking about a, um, a big Blue Cross Blue Shield plan and, and, and a, a blended model like we have with the Allegheny Health Network, you know, I mean, uh, the biggest challenge is, you know, is the bureaucracy on our side that sometimes, you know, gets in the way. And so uh, when we're working with somebody who's new, a startup, you know, we have a team that's responsible for trying to um, eliminate those barriers in that bureaucracy and simplify it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, because we do have 6 million or 7 million insured lives, you know, there are some things that we have to do from a regulatory standpoint. It's incumbent upon us to teach your organization uh, what those things are and then not to be so wed to the past that we're not willing to try things that are different. So part of the reason why we like the partnership with Google, I could have gone out and hired a thousand, um, you know, engineers. They, you know, but what they bring together is, you know, their consumer experiences, their speed of, uh, of new product introductions, those kinds of things. What I like about working with you is you're nimble, you know, you're creative, you've got great ideas and they fit and fill unmet needs that, you know, that we have as an organization, our clients do, uh, and our, and our members do. And for the record, David at one point said, bring more crazy ideas to us, right? Bring your crazy. And so I, I love that. You don't get that from a lot of CEOs of organizations like yours. Seth, we've talked about having, you know, having Friday, um, you know, for if, if you're, you know, you're probably too young, but, you know, um, you know, there used to be a show called The Gong Show. And, mm -hmm. you know, and people would come on and do crazy things. And the crazier that was, the, that was how the people won. One of the things that's really important to me is, you know, that um, we, you know, we're open to new ideas, that we're open for business and, you know, that, um, that we are able to be an innovator uh, at scale, you know, and be able to scale whatever the idea is. And so uh, it's very easy when, you know, you're successful, um, you know, as, as many of the people on this call are. Uh, to, to, to get comfortable. And I like to think of it as though we've got somebody running right behind us and we hear footsteps. So uh, we're willing to listen to crazy. I love that. Um, all right, let me turn to some of the questions in the chat for a moment. So Annie, since you run a fund that does both FinTech and healthcare, I think this one is for you. What is the role of cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, when you think about payment models in healthcare? So mm, yeah, interesting. Well, it's interesting. We, we've actually just made an investment in a company called Paxos. Uh, that's the crypto infrastructure for uh, Venmo and PayPal. And while it's not going to healthcare yet, they are doing sort of T0 settlement for trades for major banks uh, that will be announced quite soon. Um, and so what's exciting about that is the use of blockchain for real-time payment. I was actually used... Um, at Sotheby's recently in their auction, and they love it because the, so, Sotheby's actually is taking risk every time. You know, they try to verify internationally the 
um, the status of an individual who's bidding on product, but they generally have a settlement delay of getting cash and they have a lot of breakage in that. And it's interesting. Mm. That, that was like immediate settlement time. So I think there are going to be some interesting ways. I mean, we've, we've looked at things in blockchain for supply chain, right? Mm. You follow a drug all the way from, you know, from component to factory to, to the consumer, like there are some actually interesting things you can do with blockchain there. Interesting. Um, I'm going to bundle a couple questions here. Um, you know, again, back on the theme of payment models, um, how, how are both of you, uh, maybe from a large incumbent standpoint and a venture capital standpoint, thinking about capitation, either partial at risk episodes of care bundles, is that a fundamental part of living health? Is that a parallel process? You know, maybe David, first your thoughts on those kinds of models. So, you know, we believe that um, in order for us to truly innovate, you know, everybody has to be at risk. And, you know, part of the living health model is, you know, is holding people accountable for outcomes uh, and overall health. And if we do this right, um, you know, along the way, there's an opportunity for, you know, for organizations to work with us, you know, that, um, that understand that, you know, so, you know, long term, uh, fee for service is, you know, going to be here for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. But over time, that's not going to be the winning hand. Mm -hmm. You know, we think that more of a value approach will will matter. And those that can bring value in terms of outcomes and in terms of clinical uh, quality, uh, and, you know, and have an affordability filter on it, uh, they're going to do quite well. And we're willing to share uh, in that success with people. So, you know, so we're looking for people that uh, have great ideas and have the confidence to put their um, uh, money where their mouth is. That's great. Yeah. Well, and that. anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I love that because I, I fully believe it. And, you know, I think one thing that we're focused on is if we're creating lower cost, better solutions, like why shouldn't our companies actually benefit by the reduction in cost? Like I want them to take risk. It's like smart financially. Yeah. But I think for the system, I just think the only thing that really works is a, a global cap model that you are responsible for everything around that patient. Um, because otherwise like I, bundles don't work. I, I just don't, you know, I, I know it's a transitional thing. I know we're learning it like knees, hips, I mean, there's some advantage to being, being responsible for post-acute care, but that doesn't change the how many you do, right? Doesn't it, it that you know, and that's a fundamental question, right? Like, what did you need to do? What could have been done differently with therapy, you know, with physical therapy? I, I really hate things like MLTC model. I hate models where here you're responsible for the home care or you're responsible for the home and community-based care, but you're not like, wow, you know, you're 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 you know, the minute that uh, there, there's any risk with that patient, you're shoving them over to the hospital system or you know, to somebody else. Like that is a terrible model. Like I don't even know how we got there in America. I mean, we should absolutely shut down those programs because while I believe in home and community based, you can't like get, make people at risk for something where they're incented to actually push people out when there's when they get more expensive and you throw them back into the most expensive place to, you know, to take care of them. So. That I'm, you know, and I think every primary care, you know, Village MD were invested in Neverside and Firefly and Galileo, and those are going to be all like fully at risk models. Yeah, and you know, this is a webinar, and I know your inclination is to be really polite, but I really want you to feel comfortable saying exactly how you feel. You know, don't hold back on models you don't like. So, um, no, I pre appreciate that and helpful. And by the way, I, I think a little bit about that with the patient administrative experience. I mean, you're talking about it clinically, but you know, in my world, uh, when we think about the patient financial experience, it's often sliced up that way too. You've got one vendor that's kind of handling pre-service and like, hey, David, like I'd like to collect a couple dollars from you before you show up. And then there's that post, that, that kind of point of service, like, hey, let me collect $20 you're here. And then the post service is, let me now chase you for whatever's left in that bill. And if I don't get you, I'm going to send you a bad debt vendor into a delinquency vendor. And it's like, everyone gets this little slice of that patient administrative experience too. And I think that that, what you just said is something I think a lot about is like, how do we be more holistic about that? Like, why aren't we thinking more collectively, like where we want to engage David? Maybe David prefers to be more upfront versus post. And maybe others are kind of more the flip and like, let's not just have one touch, you know, there. So I think that's an interesting analogy. Um, Okay, uh, my friend Nate Gussie had an interesting question here about the role of big pharma in life sciences. 
um, which we haven't really talked about. So are, is Big Pharma a partner here? Could they be a partner? Are they uh, a blocker of some of the innovation we're trying to do? Maybe David, you start, yeah. Well, I would say that, um, you know, and I'll just take one example, Pennsylvania, you know, 27% of the healthcare costs for, you know, the average insured person, uh, commercially insured person in Pennsylvania goes to uh, pharma. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they need to be part of the equation uh, and there's potential to be, um, be part of the solution there. And so, you know, we, we think that uh, whether it's Civic RX or some of the other things that we're doing, um, you know, that's a part of the solution, uh, but there's a lot of work that's got to be done. And, you know, I mean, we're coming off of a, a pandemic where, um, where research that, you know, goes back, what, to 2008, 2009, you know, has, um, you know, been part of the, the vaccine solution uh, that, you know, that everybody believes happened overnight, but the reality of it was, there was a lot of work that was done prior to that and they deserve to be paid for that, you know, mm -hmm. and we have to find ways to make sure that we encourage uh, that kind of research and development. Um, but, you know, again, uh, pharma needs to be part of the solution. I think Annie described it well, you know, you don't want to just have the slice of the at-home you know, care. And then as soon as things start to go south, you dump them on somebody else. You want to, um, you know, have a global risk of some sort. Uh, we've done that with some of our innovative cancer drugs, uh, where they're now uh, performance-based and outcome-based. And so the compensation you know, is based on uh, their ability to deliver as promised. Mm -hmm. And we think that those kinds of things will be critically important. And again, we don't want to stifle innovation. We want to reward um, you know, improvements in quality and outcomes. That's great. Annie, are you seeing big pharma or big life science uh, in your portfolio, working constructively with your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, we don't directly invest in anything that really goes to the FDA. Um, we're used to. Um, but I would say, absolutely, you know, everybody knows that pharma, David's living this every day, that pharma is getting to be a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. Um, and we have more and more expense there as amazing drugs are created. And there's lots of innovation. And I think half of drug spend is now specialty drugs. Um, so, you know, it's, it's absolutely an issue. Um, I think that, but, it, you know, obviously the COVID vaccine is like such a miracle of, you know, um, modern medicine. It's just, it's just incredible. And we are the innovation engine for the, the world uh, and that we want to remain so. So I, I think it's a conundrum. I do think that the whole distribution chain is absolutely ridiculous and broken. I mean, we've owned a PBM, you know, in the past. We, you know, we're doing a transparent PBM uh, now uh, in terms of trying to take out, you know, make it very transparent and take out the cost and show people what the real cost, you know, these drugs are. Uh, and I do think between, you know, the distribution networks and PBMs, and there's just a lot of cost layered in to something that, that we absolutely need to simplify and figure that out. And I think you could, you could take certainly 5% out of cost right there. That's great. Um, you know, there was another question here that I'm gonna open up a bit, which was around kind of consumers and their financing needs and payment plans. And I think we are seeing to the question, you know, a big explosion around payment plans and affordability solutions for patients because patients have higher deductibles and kind of, we know that trend. But the, the way I want to open the question for you both is for David and Annie, you, if you think about in the next five years, what are some of the patient innovations or patient experiences that are coming online or that you're seeing in the frontier that you're most excited about? You know, Annie, you mentioned earlier, you know, the virtualization of care and that home-based care is really here. And we've now created a reimbursement model that hopefully will stick. So is it the virtual settings that we think is going to be the most impactful for the patients or something else on your minds? And David, maybe I'd ask you to kick that off. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, we have a company called Helion, which is, you know, is um, our at home, um, you know, footprint. And, you know, and it's a combination of, again, of clinical insights, uh, technology, and a understanding that, you know, in a um, global cap model or in a, um, a blended health model like, you know, like we have, you know, that, you know, that if we can treat the patient at home, uh, and we can keep them in a, in a better setting that it's okay to not, or to lose that, um, that revenue that you get from being in a hospital. And, you know, we feel as though um, that we're in a point now where you have the, the tools from a technological standpoint, the monitors, uh, et cetera, 
that if you have a bricks and mortar light footprint uh, and one that's more mobile and you can bring the clinicians to people, uh, that, you know, that's the wave of the future. I mean, how my 30 year old son in Los Angeles, um, you know, uh, consumes healthcare is dramatically different uh, than maybe uh, the way I did when, you know, when I was growing up. His expectation is to leverage uh, every resource that's you know, possible that's virtual. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, he's not willing to accept uh, poor performance. And so finding a blend there is, is where I think we're headed. Hmm. Interesting. And so what, what would you say that in the next like five years that like some sort of home-based setting will be a critical part of a network, like that will be in that part of in-network care? A absolutely. Uh, and, and again, you know, I mean, uh, what you have to do is to rethink the economics of the system and rethink um, and, and but start with the clinical pathways. You know, today, uh, if you own a hospital system uh, or if you're a provider, uh, you know, you, you, you know, in your paid fee for service, it's not in your best interest to send that patient home early unless there's some sort of a cap on the, on the reimbursement. You know, if they can hold a patient for an extra day in a hospital, um, then there's a revenue that comes associated with that. In our model, you know, we are paying our people for performance, you know, quality outcomes uh, and making sure that the care is you know, right size so that it's the right care, the right place and the right time. And so if we can uh, avoid having them in the hospital, that's good news. And my perfect example is right behind me is Allegheny General across the river. And by the way, quite um, literally, I don't think people know yeah. where you pointed is that's literally the building. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the number one trauma center in the region, number one heart program in Pennsylvania, uh, has the highest um, complex case, um, you know, medical case index in the state. And, and uh, what that means is the really complex and the really sick uh, go there. And that's where you want to be. One of the ways we've been able to do that is by, you know, by reducing the level one and two uh, emergency room visits. And the way we did that was by providing same day appointments with primary care physicians, you know, finding ways to, uh, to get care closer to where people lived in the neighborhoods. And that freed up a center like Allegheny General to be able to do the most complex work, mm -hmm. uh, which is a win for the clinicians and it's a win for the patients. Uh, and it's a win for the families. And so, uh, so when you start to think about it that way, it changes and your incentives are realigned. Um, you're, you're doing what's right for your patients and for your, your, your employers and everybody involved and uh, doing good for the community. Mm -hmm. That's right. Annie, what would, you, what would you add to that? What do you see as the big patient innovation on the horizon? Well, I think it, it is all about site of care and home care and virtualization are the movement. You know, we have things all the way from you know, investments in companies like Dispatch, uh, which is essentially a hospital in a home. Um, it's going to be advanced care, you know, uh, advanced medical care from a car. So they've literally outfitted cars and are, have contracts with payers all over America. Uh, and we're seeing them in Connecticut and we're seeing them everywhere. And we're so excited because it really is, uh, they figured out a model to provide really, you know, sort of acute and advanced care, you know, from a car and, and minimizing uh, trips to the ER, uh, which is brilliant in my mind. Um, and then just generally home, home care in general. I mean, I, somebody said to me, oh gosh, you know, I mean, obviously, if you look at the haves and have nots during COVID, you know, technology, you know, was an issue and there was an equity issue in terms of who had access and who had Wi-Fi and who had broadband. And I actually think technology is the great equalizer in healthcare, because if you look at systems at risk, I mean, if you look at, Medi you know, look at Medicaid, where they're at risk for individuals, you look at the dual eligible programs. The reality, those programs can now and are now with a number of our companies, Vesta, CareBridge, putting remote patient monitoring, I mean, we can afford like to put patient remote patient monitoring in the phone to put per, you know, have per systems. So that instead of that, you know, you push the button and instead of going 911, go to the hospital, like all of a sudden it goes to dispatch or, you know, it goes to a care a supervisor, nurse supervisor over the $15 or $10 an hour caregiver saying, okay, what's the issue? What's going on? No, you don't need to go to the hospital or we'll get you, you know, somebody to your home. Um, and so you can really provide a 
a great environment at much less cost than these seriously ill patients are costing the system. And it's just a much better experience for them and, uh, and obviously uh, saves the system more money. So we are all about home care and virtualization and enablement. Um, yeah, that's great. And so very similar theme. It's interesting. A lot of the companies you just referenced, Annie, are doing this kind of outside of a hospital construct or kind of uh, sometimes in competition with it. David, you're working within a system that has that hospital construct and you're evolving it um, to handle those more complex cases. So it's, it's fascinating to kind of see that evolution. Um, so, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're keeping close track of the time and I, I'll probably wrap up with this question, um, which is the role of the payer. Um, and, and by payer, I mean both the health plan and the employer. You know, Highmark as a health plan works with many large ASOs. Um, we've talked about virtualization of care, different sites of setting, payment models of capitation where a lot of the risk might go to primary care doctors. So then what is the role of the payer, ASO slash health plan, in that world? Well, I, I think the role of the payer is, is, I mean, there's a lot of different pieces and parts. I mean, uh, in the case of an ASO, obviously, you know, I mean, um, you know, we handle all the transactions, the back office, how, you know, how things are, are flow through. Uh, I think this year we've, you know, I mean, almost $30, $30 billion has flowed through uh, our system uh, and, you know, and been used to pay for care in, um, you know, all across the country. And so I think there's always going to be a need for that because I, I, as we've seen, even really large companies struggle uh, with interacting in the healthcare systems. Uh, you know, I mean, we've seen uh, large companies who have tried to go it alone and figure out their own approach uh, and that hasn't worked. And part of that reason is because, um, you know, they can't get through the last mile. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, you know, in that last mile, you have the physician engagement and you have the patient engagement and you've got to change behavior. And I think that's where um, like a Highmark uh, and, and having a uh, integrated or a blended model like we do with the Allegheny Health Network uh, puts us in a unique place where we add value to uh, employers uh, that's a little different than just aggregating risk and paying claims. Because the future for all payers uh, is to move from just aggregating risk and paying claims and being uh, a partner in how care is delivered, uh, incentivizing the, the, the right care uh, and doing it in the right ways. And so, um, you know, we no longer can be across the table from people, as I described with Christiana, we're now on the same side with Christiana. Um, and, you know, being the second largest integrated health system in the, in the country behind Kaiser, you know, uh, between Highmark and the Allegheny Health Network, we're full at risk. I mean, if we yeah. deliver the outcomes, uh, we win. If we, yeah. you know, if we keep people out of that acute setting in the hospitals, um, and, you know, and we deliver better value than, you know, large corporations, ASOs, um, will, you know, will seek us out. Uh, and that's our objective. Yeah. I mean, is it fair to say that in some ways a health, the health plan in your system is evolving from managing risk to managing information too. And I think about like the work you're doing with Google and the Google cloud of being more of a data company and leveraging the data that you have to drive these experiences. Absolutely, Seth. I mean, it's where it's, you know, we sort of started this conversation is, you know, a curated health experience means we give you the tools to be able to make good choices and, and it's up to you. But we also give, uh, we take that data and, and more importantly, the insights that we're developing with Google, you know, the insights that we can bring to the table that also um, enable you and your clinicians to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to avoid some of the, you know, some of the really difficult things that we see. We have a country that um, is awash in chronic disease. And, you know, and if we, if we want to change how healthcare is delivered and the cost of healthcare, you know, we've got to, um, you know, bend the curve around chronic disease. Right. Annie, I'll turn it to you for any concluding thoughts. I'll just say that, you know, for us at Udo, we founded the company because we felt that it was imperative now for payers and providers to work together on behalf of the patient and work for the patient versus putting the patient in between two organizations or that were just fighting with each other uncoordinated. So to hear you talk about the work that you're doing and the evolution you've taken 
is so energizing for us because that's truly the mission of what we built. Um, so with that, Annie, I'll leave it to you. Any final thoughts you wanted to share on the role of the payer? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything David said. And you know, when we seated Uda and worked with Seth and, and Giovanni, it really was about this, this integrated view and the reality that the consumer was losing out. Uh, and the only way to actually create a better member experience for a payer uh, and for the consumer was to have the payer ultimately responsible for the lifeline of that bill, right? Because you, you go to many different, you may be touching many different providers, they may be in different systems, and the, pay, it's, the, the patient has no idea actually what, you know, what their bill is and what they owe. And I have heard so many people from payers and providers say, oh, I wait nine months before I pay anything because I have no idea, you know, like what I actually owe. Um, and so, it, you know, what was interesting to me is it, was, it, it ended up being about the member experience at the end of the day. And you, the only entity that, that has the longitudinal uh, exp, uh, you know, relationship with the member is the payer. That's right. Uh, so that's where it you know, has to reside. Um, and very important part of our system. Thank you. I think that's a great place to, to end it. Um, David, Annie, thank you so much for taking the time to participate in this and for your support and evangelism of all this great innovation out there. It was really a pleasure. Thank you both. We appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, David. Thanks, Seth.